Mississauga have the ability to control our own destiny. The mayor says too much money is flowing out of the city and into other parts of Peel. Plus... The integrity commissioner found that we followed the letter of the law. The premier claims complete vindication after a new report clears him of wrongdoing in the naming of Ron Tavener as head of the OPP. And would you live on Cemetery Road? Some developers are worried you won't, so they're pushing for a name change. Good evening, I'm Mike Wise. The city of Mississauga is making it official. It wants to break up with Peel Region. City Council putting its support behind a motion for the city of more than 700,000 to go it alone. But as Kelda Yoon tells us, its neighbors to the north are saying, not so fast. This is a very populous sentiment, saga strong right here in Mississauga. Mayor Bonnie Crombie thinks she's onto something. She's convinced Mississauga should leave Peel Region. $85 million is transferred to the region each year, each year, paying for the growth of Brampton and Caledon. So we think that's an opportunity for $85 million to be reinvested into the priorities of Mississauga, businesses and residents. It's an idea first pushed by former Mayor Hazel McCallion more than 15 years ago, and it's something many residents are on board with. We're sixth largest city in Canada, so we should probably be self-sustainable by now, so uh, might as well just get it done. I think if it's going to fund for the betterment of like the city for Mississauga, I think it would be a cool idea. But in Brampton, Mayor Patrick Brown thinks his neighbors have a short memory when it comes to who paid for what. When Mississauga was growing, when Mississauga needed to have regional funding, when they were going through significant growth, it was Brampton taxpayers that helped subsidize that. This sentiment isn't lost on some Brampton residents. For them to want to leave now after they've bumped up their society and their infrastructure and we're in the process of doing it now, I think the timing's a little weak. I think it's selfish. I think that, you know, working together to kind of pool resources and that I think helps all the communities. There are benefits of pooling resources. Right now through the region we pool the cost of policing. Are we going to have our own police forces at a much smaller level? I'm not sure that makes sense. But Crombie says there is money to be saved by getting rid of duplications. There are two planning departments. We don't need to do planning at the region and planning at the city, get two legal departments, etc. There's a lot of duplication with two levels of government. So we know that we can be more cost effective and more efficient single tier as an independent city. The next step for the city will be to hold a public town hall meeting next month to get the input of residents. Kelda Yoon, CBC News, Mississauga. Two firefighters sustained injuries tonight after responding to a two-alarm fire at a restaurant in the Bathurst and St. Clair area. Both were assessed by paramedics who sent one of them to hospital suffering smoke inhalation and some minor burns. Emergency crews were called to a low-rise building near Vaughn Road and Arlington Avenue around 8.45. Police say the fire is now out and roads in the area have since reopened. Premier Doug Ford says today he feels vindicated after a new report from Ontario's Integrity Commissioner found he did not break the rules when he tried to appoint his friend Ron Taverner to lead the OPP. But still, Ontario's ethics watchdog is critical of the hiring process. CBC's Queen's Park reporter Mike Crawley has that story. It's a very specific ruling that Premier Doug Ford did not breach the Members Integrity Act. This 100-page report from the Integrity Commissioner finds no evidence that there was a conflict of interest for Ford uh, when his longtime friend Ron Taverner was appointed to lead the Ontario Provincial Police. But still, this report does have some harsh words for Ford's government. And in particular, it seems to suggest that Doug Ford's chief of staff was knee-deep in the hiring process. The Integrity Commissioner says there were some troubling aspects to that hiring process that may have led to a preference being given to one candidate. Well, what are those troubling aspects? Evidence that the province's top civil servant, Cabinet Secretary Steve Orsini, felt pressure to hire Taverner. And for the Integrity Commissioner, the most disconcerting thing were text messages between Orsini, and Doug Ford's Chief of Staff, Dean French, that were all about Ron Taverner during the hiring process. Anyone seeing these messages would have serious doubts that the process was fair, said the Integrity Commissioner. Now, Doug Ford is setting aside all of that, and he's focused on the report's finding that says that he did not breach the ethics law.
I wasn't involved in it. It was very clear. And maybe if we went back to the old process, maybe I should have been involved. But I stayed, and it was very clear in his report that I stayed out of it. And I kept saying I stayed out of it. And it's proven now. The NDP laid the complaint with the Integrity Commissioner, and they're saying that this report reveals a campaign by Doug Ford's inner circle to get Taverner into the job. This raises more questions than any answers uh, that Doug Ford just gave in his press conference or in the House. Uh, it looks like a coordinated effort to do everything that they could to push forward Mr. Tavener in through this appointment. We don't know at this point whether uh, Doug Ford was doing Dean French's dirty work or Dean French was doing Doug Ford's dirty work. And yet the that's, so inter that's how intertwined they are at this level. That story from our Mike Crawley. Now, one other thing to note about the Integrity Commissioner's report, it says that last August, before the OPP job became available, Tavener was offered a $270,000 a year job with the Ontario Cannabis Store, but he turned it down, not wanting to leave policing. It's been a bit of a long winter. Can I ask you what you're most looking forward to about spring? Uh, the warm weather. I usually try to embrace the winter, but... Um, How's that work for you? It's not been great lately. I'm ready, I'm ready for spring. What are you most looking forward to about spring? Being able to walk outside without carrying five layers of jackets. <laughs> yeah, you don't know what you're gonna get hit with in the next two months, but I don't know, it's gonna be great to finally get out in the sun. Patio season for sure. <laughs> I like how you're thinking. How long do you think it takes? Like we're just the beginning spring until you're ready for the patio. Spring is a clever month. It usually creeps up and then it retreats. So I think it's another two months before we can have consistent patio weather. Uh, summer, getting out with the dog, not being so cold, going up north, all those things. Lots of things to look forward to, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. So a lot of people happy to welcome spring tonight. I'm happy to welcome Colette Kennedy here with that <laughs> spring forecast for us. Yes, I'm so glad that it's here, that we've made it. And you know what a day to go along with it, right? We saw some beautiful conditions out there. All right, things have been changing over the last few hours, but the average high at this time of year is only five degrees and unofficially, it's probably spiked actually a little higher than this, but unofficially 9.5 today. And much of the day with that sunshine until the clouds started pulling in as the system's been pushing through. So that showery weather we've been seeing developing and that will continue mostly as showers towards the lakeshore, a little bit of a mix, possibly some sleep, but mostly a bit of wet flurry activity a little bit further to the north, more showers back towards southwestern Ontario. But through the overnight hours as the temperature falls, we'll probably see a little bit of mix into the GTA as well. And some of this lingering into tomorrow morning, this is even lunchtime tomorrow, could see a bit of instability, especially to the east of the city and still a little bit of a mix. It gets much patchier, but to the north of us, even some patchy fog overnight tonight. So all of that to deal with. And then through the day tomorrow, still a lot of cloud cover pretty thick. We'll start to see some breaks developing late afternoon to get a little sunshine through here. There's another more significant system that's going to come through, however, a stronger cold front for Friday. That will bring some lake effect, which could drive some flurries down into the GTA, and it also means we'll see some blustery northwesterly winds. So that's coming up on Friday, but overnight tonight, two degrees, and then into tomorrow afternoon, hopefully getting a few breaks there, Mike, and the high up to six. Not quite as mild as today. All right. Thanks, Colette. You're welcome. The man who triggered last night's Amber Alert for a missing girl will not be facing any charges. In fact, the father, who was arrested after police issued a province-wide search for him, says he did nothing wrong. But police maintain they had reason to believe his daughter was in danger. Farah Morali has more. This was the dramatic scene outside of Markham Locksmith yesterday. Police, with guns drawn, storming inside. I was so scared. No. <laughs> So many people came in just like you guys came in and I was nervous. Officers were looking for this man, Solomon Joffrey. Today we caught up with him in Windsor in a less dramatic scene. Yesterday he was the suspect in an Amber Alert after his wife reported their five-year-old missing. There was no legal documentation saying that I couldn't be with my daughter. Joffrey says he was just picking up his daughter from school for lunch. He was interrogated then released without charges. There was concern uh, for the child's safety right out of the, the gate. Police couldn't say today just what that concern was, only that it was credible, and it rarely moves to issue an Amber Alert. We also deal with plenty of domestic situations where there's custody issues, where people call uh, and, and have concerns for child, a child 
they don't escalate to that Amber Alert level. So, you know, I can tell you there was a definite concern yesterday for that child's safety, uh, and we engaged all resources. The OPP is responsible for issuing all Amber Alerts in Ontario. It only does so if three criteria are met. The first is that a law enforcement agency believes a child under 13 has been abducted. The second, that the agency believes the child is in danger. And finally, there has to be a description of the child, the abductor, or a vehicle. Once the OPP has determined these three criteria are met, the Amber Alert is issued immediately. York Regional Police contacted the OPP at 4.15 yesterday. That was about an hour before the alert went out. We were advised that a child had been abducted earlier on um, before the Amber Alert was uh, activated. And we, we get advice of that, and then the checks and balances need to be met. Within an hour after the alert was issued, police were able to find Joffrey and his daughter, thanks to someone who saw the Amber Alert. But just like the last time an alert was issued, police got a barrage of complaints from the public about being interrupted on their phones and TVs. We did get complaints, um, some 911 complaints, not to the volume that we did the last time but people still uh, feel compelled to call 911 to complain. Farah Morelli, CBC News, Toronto. We're taking a closer look tonight at the federal government's plan to help first-time home buyers. It was announced in yesterday's budget. But as Mukta Gabrasalase tells us, Toronto's red-hot real estate market may stretch that extra help a little thin. Are there many places in Toronto for less than $480,000? We don't get too many of these days in this in Toronto at all at that price point. We're going to look at one though. We are going to look at one. So this is a one bedroom. Yes, it is. Okay. Shall we start in the uh, kitchen living room area? Okay. So this condo near Park Lawn and the Gardener is listed at three hundred and ninety-nine thousand dollars. Online, you can find a few listings around that price. But this realtor says these prices are most likely a starting point for multiple offers. So how much good can the government's plan do with a cap of $480,000? The cap is a little tight for the Toronto market, considering the price points that are fairly high and it's a bit more fair in, in other parts of the country, obviously. Under 400000 But the new program could help this Mississauga couple. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, awesome they've been searching for a home for more than two years while paying rent in the meantime. Some family have agreed to help them financially. Gotta wait, gotta save, gotta look elsewhere. Clearly we can't look yeah. within the GTA. So. And then when we actually had something, we actually had the money ready to go, then the bidding wars were happening and they were like, okay, great. Now we definitely can't get a home. They're now searching for homes in Hamilton, Waterloo and Niagara. Now that it's possible the federal government could also pitch in, their dream of owning a home is still alive. The government estimates that its plan for first-time buyers could help about 100,000 people across the country purchase their first home. But how many of them will be buying here in Toronto? That's hard to say. Mark de Gabriel-Salasa, CBC News, Toronto. There's all the jokes about we live in the dead center of town and the people are dying to get in this neighborhood and so on. A developer's bid to rename Cemetery Road in Uxbridge has hit a dead end. What residents have to say about their creepy address, that's coming up.
Welcome back. Toronto Mayor John Tory today announcing the next phase of the city's Vision Zero plan. That's its plan to make streets safer for pedestrians and cyclists. Tory said the Vision Zero 2.0 plan comes after studying pedestrian deaths in Scarborough, which has the highest ratio of fatal pedestrian collisions in the city. Scarborough has the most arterial roads in the city. Arterial roads being defined as roads with four or more lanes of traffic and a speed limit of 60 kilometers per hour or higher. Scarborough also has the longest walking distance between protected, safe crossings compared to the rest of the city. So, for example, pedestrians have to walk on average six additional minutes to use a safe crossing, a crosswalk or a signalized intersection compared to residents of Toronto and East York. Of the 41 citywide pedestrian deaths in 2018, 16 of those were in Scarborough. Tory said he'll be asking city staff to study lowering speed limits on arterial roads around the city, creating more mid-block crosswalks and installing more red light cameras. Students at many colleges and universities across the province walked out of class today to protest the province's changes to post-secondary funding. This was the scene at OCAD University. The PCs eliminated free tuition for low-income students back in January and made several once mandatory student fees, such as those that fund campus organizations and clubs, optional. Today's protest was organized by the Canadian Federation of Students Ontario chapter and was said to involve more than 17 school campuses. Well, there's a fight brewing in one of the quietest neighborhoods in Uxbridge. A developer is asking the town to rename a local street. He says buyers are getting spooked and don't want to live near Cemetery Road. As Nick Robert tells us, people who already live there aren't dying to change things. The neighbors across the street are very quiet and neat. Donald Bagshaw lives right across from a cemetery. And like most people in this neighborhood, he's heard it all. There's all the jokes about we live in the dead center of town and people are dying to get in this neighborhood and so on. And you live on Cemetery Road, that's your address? What's yes. that been like? Fine. Some people uh, look and say they don't know whether they could live there, but uh, most of us are just fine with it. These days, the street has come to life a few blocks away from the cemetery, where a new subdivision, including townhouses and low-rise condos, is under construction. But the developer says some people are getting scared off by the local street sign. It's pushing their decision maybe to buy or not to buy if they're sitting on the fence. They're indicating to us they just don't like the name. The developers making this request, even though the homes here aren't technically on Cemetery Road, instead they're going to have addresses that correspond to these brand new streets, like Harry Thornton Lane. Maplebrook Homes formally requested the name change this week. It's never come up as an issue or it's never been a point of discussion with the residents that I've talked to. Councillor yeah, so Willie Pop the, says the, the inconveniences might be too large to ignore. Uh, People already reside on Cemetery Road, and if you look at that from a perspective of all the documentation and information that you'd have to change for the residents, it would be fairly costly. The town is working on a report about the pros and cons of a change. Local council will make a decision after it's ready. Nick Boisvert, CBC News, Uxbridge. A live shot of downtown Toronto. It's officially spring. Colette will be back with our springtime forecast after the break.
The weather update is brought to you by Train Extreme Conditions Testing. It's hard to stop a train, really hard. Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. The Leafs in Buffalo tonight aiming to snap a two-game losing skid. Sabres, though, draw first blood. Casey Middlestad with a sharp with a shot from a sharp angle. That gets past Garrett Sparks. Second period, this one ain't pretty, but we'll take it. Andreas Johnson sends it in front and off the skate of Austin Matthews here to tie the game. Later in the second, William Nylander's shot goes off the post but finds his way to John Tavares, who finds his 41st goal of the year. Start of the third, Tavares passes between his legs to Mitch Marner, who takes it to the middle and fires. Carter Hutton actually makes the stop, but the puck goes off the skate of his teammate and in. It's 3-1 Toronto there. They'd go on to win this one 4-2. And Serge Ibaka back in the Raptors lineup tonight after serving a three-game suspension. Toronto facing his former team, the Oklahoma City Thunder. Opening quarter, Pascal Siakam attacks and scores off the glass. Later, Dennis Schroeder has his attempt blocked by Ibaka. Norman Powell in transition here over to OG Anubi who finishes with the two-handed slam. Second quarter, Toronto moving the ball quickly with good passing. Marcus Gasol to Siakam here in the corner. He buries the three-pointer. Right now in the third, the score is 86 to 75. Kellogg Kennedy's back with their extended forecast. I know it says spring now on the calendar, but you have me worried about what's coming later this week. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, we're officially there, but then it's always that situation of the temperatures. It's a transitional season, so the temperature's going up and down and up and down. And because of that, I always like to use this sort of a description that, yes, okay, spring has started, we're there, but when will it actually feel like spring? Well, it's usually about a month later. So what I mean by that is, yes, it was mild today. We're going to have a mild day into this coming weekend. But I mean where it's more consistent, where we don't see those dips coming in. So you kind of usually have to give it another three weeks, maybe four weeks or so. This is what we're looking at, though, with the system that's moving through some of the patchy precipitation. We've been seeing some shower activity a little bit, getting more into a mix overnight tonight, a little further towards the north, a little bit of fog development through here as well. And although there's not a lot of moisture here still looking at perhaps tomorrow morning's commute being a little bit wet in spots and then we'll see this pushing through but as it goes through leaving behind some cloud cover and a bit of instability hoping to see some sunny breaks but I'm thinking into the late afternoon before that probably will start to develop I want you to take your attention though to this cold front back here to the northwest of us so Thursday the temperature comes down a little bit but this is one of those ones that makes spring so inconsistent this front will come through in to Friday, early Friday, in fact, northwesterly winds will become quite blustery, may even see some lake effect snow setting up, and that some of those flurries will make their way into the GTA. So Friday, the temperature falls off as well. The winds, too, they're going to be moving away from that more southerly to southeasterly direction and then becoming qu quite strong. Some of the gusts up towards 60, 65 kilometers an hour from the north to northwest on Friday. So just a blustery day. Here we are overnight tonight in southwestern Ontario with lows of 3 to 4 degrees and some wet conditions and fog. Tomorrow, though, highs 9 to 10. Hoping you'll see some sunny breaks as we get later on into the day there, too. Overnight tonight, 1 to 2 degrees. St. Catharines at 3 with that mixed precipitation, especially to the north and then highs tomorrow there you see a little bit down from where they were today at nearly 10 degrees friday that cooler day but look into the weekend yeah the first spring weekend we'll be seeing as high pressure builds in that stabilizes things sunshine and five degrees saturday and mike i'm very encouraged to see double digits for sunday we'll get through friday but sunday's looking great thanks a yeah, lot yeah when we know we have that ahead of us that's yes. right thank you you're welcome
Well, you've heard about tobogganing, but what about dogbogganing? This is sent in from a viewer, Kate Ward in Collingwood, her favorite moment of winter. These are her dogs, Duke and Bowie, having the time of their lives going down the slopes. No sled required. Well, the first day of spring, and that means baseball can't be far off. And at the Rogers Center, they've been busy for weeks to make sure everything is ready. As soon as February hit, we started working on the field. That involved cleaning out all the dirt where it meets the turf to make sure the turf is clean when we start it. Uh, then we have to roll it out in sections. Now each roll of turf is five meters wide and up to 58 meters long and has to be secured with Velcro. As for food, the Rogers Center is touting some new items this season, including a $5 value menu, which will include $5 beer. But just at one kiosk, per level, so start lining up now. Mark your calendars, opening day is next Thursday, March 28th. I cannot wait, plenty of time to start studying up and learning the names of this year's starting lineup. Well, tomorrow on Q, Mary Walsh, the star of Codco, and this hour has 22 minutes, will be talking about the Lifetime Achievement Award she'll be receiving this year at the Canadian Screen Awards. That's tomorrow at 10 a.m. I'll see you back here tomorrow night at 11. Good night.